Welcome to Wilson Center Now. I'm your host, John Molesky. Our guest today is a veteran State Department Middle East advisor who now serves as the Wilson Center's Middle East Program Director and its Vice President of New Initiatives. No one better to discuss Middle East politics and the, and the situation in the region than our own Aaron David Miller. Aaron, welcome. Thank you for joining Always us. Always a pleasure to be with you, John. You know, we, we can talk about specific issues and headlines, but you and I both have adopted this terrific idea that the Wilson Center focuses on trend lines and not headlines. Uh, and it's a great phrase because it has meaning uh, for us. And uh, I, I want to step back from the headlines with that in mind and have you talk about the bigger picture in the Middle East. And I wonder, ha have we lost our way? Have we lost sight of what our interests are in the region? Well, it's a fascinating question. And I think we don't do strategy well. I mean, I, I heard that there was a, a comment made actually during the previous administration that said strategy, it's such a 19th century word. <laughs> but whether you glorify it by calling it a strategy, you know, if you don't know where you're going, as the old saw goes, any road will get you there. And the reality is we are stuck in the middle of a broken, angry, dysfunctional region. The headlines are bad, the trend lines are bad. You have leaders who cannot see beyond their own narrow sectarian, corporatist, ethnic uh, affiliations to think about the broader interests of their peoples as a whole. Mm -hmm. You have gender inequality for a variety of reasons. And how can you produce productive societies if half of, the, of your population for any number of reasons are excluded from the public square and from fair and free participation to fulfill their own desires and ambitions. You have four Arab states, Syria, Libya, Iraq, and um, Yemen in various stages of, of meltdown. And I, th I think this poses a huge problem for a great power who still has not managed to find the right balance between risk readiness on one hand, you could argue that characterized George W. Bush's foreign policy and risk aversion on the other, uh, which many people charge the, the Obama administration. The Trump administration has inherited this mess. My own view of this, if you can't transform and you can't extricate, then you really are only left with a middle, the middle course, the sober, realist course of what I call transaction. You identify your core interests. You don't get distracted by discretionary enterprises that sap American lives, treasure, and credibility. And you identify those interests and you pursue them in a very disciplined manner. That, that I would argue, whether it was the Trump administration or the administration X, and this is going to last for a while. This is not, we're not turning any corners here in 2020 or 2024 with respect to these regional trends. That's what I, that would be my RX, my is prescription. There, is there agreement on what those core values or core interests are? I don't think so. Uh, my three favorite, uh, because they all relate to American security and prosperity. If it sounds like America first, it's really not intended to sound like America first, but the reality is, the organizational, uh, organizing principle of any nation's foreign policy is to protect American security and prosperity. Um, I, I would argue there are three. One, to prevent another catastrophic attack on the uh, continental United States. 9-11 was the second bloodiest day in, in American history, exceeded by only one other day not far from here, I think September. September 1862, the Battle of Antietam, when more Americans were killed in an afternoon than in any other day in American history. Second, to maintain access to oil, Arab hydrocarbons. Not so much, we are weaning ourselves off of Arab hydrocarbons, but the rest of the world is not. And we need to ensure that there's a free flow. Mm -hmm. And finally, to prevent the emergence of a regional hegemon, any single power challenging our interests, our friends, particularly one equipped with a nuclear weapon. Now, now many will dispute this. Many will say, but Aaron, what about values? Motion of democracy. Exactly. What about values? What about conflict resolution? What about humanitarian intervention? What about all these things? And I would argue they are extremely important. The question is whether or not in, in those specific, with those specific interests, whether or not we can actually exert the kind of control and influence uh, because that involves change. It involves restructuring internal societies of other countries. It involves humanitarian interventions. And you know my view on this, with the exception of Bosnia and Kosovo. You, you just line them up from the Holocaust to Rwanda, to Congo, to Rohingya. We have failed to intercede in any significant, uh, in the face of any significant mass killing. Mm -hmm. None. We have these principle of never again. I wish it were so.
but we continue not to play the lead role. So I guess I'm a realist. I'm not ignoring that. I devoted a better part of my professional life to trying to figure out how to help Arabs and Israelis figure this out. But we, we, I would argue to you that we, we have a limited role to play in the interest that we just identified. Is it, is it uh, counterproductive the way that we tend to think about the world? We talk about the Middle East, we lump it together. You began by describing situations in a variety of countries that have some overlap and similarity, but also have very unique circumstances. And is it counterproductive the way the U.S. looks out at the world and says this is a group, the Middle East? And should we be thinking more in terms of individual policy toward individual nations? Well, yeah. I mean, and I think in, in, in a way we, we can, if we can get away from the broad sort of broad brush bromides that pass very often for American strategy, often very unsuccessfully, if not catastrophically. Oh, no, sure. I mean, our policy toward Egypt, um, I mean, I, I make the case for interventions, for example. We, we intervened in Iraq in a major way, but in the face of uh, mass killing, we didn't intervene in Syria. And in Libya, we interceded. We've facilitated Gaddafi's removal, but then we didn't follow up. So, no, there is no cookie cutter approach to the region. The other issue, and we've discussed this before, is whether or not we actually see the world in in a sober, realist, mm -hmm. realistic manner. And and you know my rap: we're sandwiched between two non-predatory powers to our north and south, and fish to our east and west. What one historian called our liquid assets. I would argue that this geographic, I call it geographic determinism really shapes the way we see the world. I wouldn't trade our geographic position for anything, but we need to be aware of what that geographic position, how it shapes, I would argue, distorts our view. Because we, we have this notion of American exceptionalism, and I would argue we are exceptional, but the exceptionalism stops at the water's edge because the exceptionalism is geared to the historic, political, and geographic circumstances that made this country what it is. And I think it's not for, it's not export for export. the North American continent. Really hard to export. The, so the, speaking of things we've discussed before, things that you've written about or talked about, uh, leadership and the end of greatness, your book about American presidents, it seems as if this is ripe for some leader to emerge to grab the reins of a chaotic situation. Is there the possibility of leadership emerging in the region? Well, I look around and I see a lot of strong men. I see Erdogan in Turkey, who is trying to become the new Mustafa Kemal, the new Ataturk, uh, fairly successfully, but under tremendous constraints and with tremendous challenges. I see Mohammed bin Salman, the young 30-something, cultivated by the Trump administration. But then again, for all of his domestic reforms, which I think are important, he really is interested more in control and ensuring that all of the domestic opponents are repressed, co-opted, or eliminated. Mm -hmm. And he's pursuing some policies abroad in Yemen, in Qatar, uh, and again, repressing dissent at home, which I think do not, certainly they're not in, in our interest. You have Sisi, who some Egyptian analysts would argue is more authoritarian than Hosni Mubarak. So yes, you have men, only men it seems, who are adept at keeping their seats. But when it comes to actually creating policies that benefit their countries and the citizens who live in them as a whole, not so much. Is it, are, do you think that it's because we now live in a time where everything is niche audiences, everything is fractured? So for any leader to emerge of a mass movement, to g gain the respect and attention of millions and millions of people, it's almost impossible. Well, the question is, I think they can gain attention. The question is whether they can create Well, followers a, versus just attention. Exactly. Followers in the, in the best sense of the word. And that requires civic participation. That requires what the Middle East lacks, which is That's the, Arab, the Arab Middle East, which is a, a, one, a single functioning democracy. You know, it was Tacitus, the first century Roman historian, who said, I think this is brilliant, um, that the best day after the death of a bad emperor is always the first day. And that is the epitaph, in my judgment, for the Arab Spring. There was a chance. Millions out in the streets in Tunisia and Egypt and Syria. Um, was? Past seeking, tense? Is it over? Well, it's is not over. Forward? It's another phase. But the fact is liberal Democrats, 
could not compete with the two groups that were more dedicated, more principled, and more ruthless, the militaries in these countries and the Islamists. So one final thought then, with all of that we've talked about, uh, do you see anything on the horizon that can alter the equation in the short term, or are we just talking about continuing to muddle along in imperfect ways for the foreseeable future? I think it's the latter. I would urge all of uh, the listeners out there, and I try, since leaving the State Department uh, in, tw in 2003, I've committed myself to trying to create a baseline, which is to first, if you want to fix the world, you better first understand it. And the reality is we cannot allow our own delusions, illusions, and aspirations and our image of what we want for ourselves to somehow shape the way we view the world. We should stand up for our principles human rights, promotion of democracy, but we have to do so in a way that's actually quite respectful and humble, I would think, in the face of um, the myriad situations that we face. The headlines don't look good, John. The trend lines don't look good. I know this is what my words here, annoyingly negative analysis. And I haven't given up hope for this region or for a better world, but I have shed in the interests of our national interests a lot of my illusions. Aaron, thank you as always. John, it's always a pleasure. pleasure. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Wilson Center Now. And please join us again in the future, either on the video version or if you prefer listening on the podcast version. Thanks again.